Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar. The man known as El Cid is undeniably one of the most celebrated figures of medieval history. His name epitomizes Spanish chivalry and the warrior spirit of the Reconquista. Even during his lifetime, his reputation catapulted him to heroic status, and over the centuries, the legend of El Cid has almost completely eclipsed the historical man. During the 12th and 13th centuries, El Cid came to be closely associated with the chivalric ideals of the High Middle Ages. He stars in a masterpiece of medieval literature, the Poema de Mio Cid, composed roughly a century after his death. The Poema is a magnificent and powerful work that champions the knightly ethos of the late 12th century. Although it contains components of El Cid's historical career, it inevitably casts him as a mythic hero designed to fulfill the expectations of a 12th century audience. For example, much of the poem is concerned with El Cid avenging the honor of his daughters after they suffered grave mistreatment at the hands of their husbands, the Infantes of Carrion. Although it's true that El Cid had two daughters, they were never married to the Infantes of Carrion, and the story of their abuse and El Cid's vengeance is entirely fictional. However, the scenario would have had a late 12th century audience on the edge of their seats, the perfect dramatization of knightly honor and valor. In modern times, El Cid came to be revered as a national hero of Spain, embodying the virtues of a heroic age. The enduring power of the Cid's legend is on display in the 1961 film El Cid, directed by Anthony Mann and starring Charlton Heston. The movie is a mixture of history and a more than generous helping of fiction, with the Cid shown in armor that's far more late medieval than the simpler chainmail suit and iron cap that the historical Rodrigo would have worn. Charlton Heston portrays a multiculturalist El Cid, seeking to heal divisions between Christian and Moor. Once again, the Cid is presented to meet the expectations of his audience. Indeed, since the 20th century, it's become fashionable to conceive of a Cid with no religious loyalties, a proto-modernist who showed no preference for Christians over Muslims. This, of course, is just as inaccurate as the late medieval legends, and is a great deal more anachronistic. Despite this long history of legend, we should not despair of tracking down the historical El Cid, nor should we assume that the actual man is any less fascinating. In fact, the real El Cid, what we know about him from the reliable source material for his life, is probably a lot more interesting than all the mythologizing that came later. His career is a prime example of the dynamic adventurism and opportunism of the 11th century. Born to a rather modest house of the Castilian nobility, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar would come to be the trusted advisor of kings, an undefeated mercenary captain, and finally, a conquering prince. In an age when the Almoravids of North Africa were on the rise and inflicting serious defeats on the Christian kings of the Iberian Peninsula, El Cid would face their powerful armies on the battlefield and win against them in a series of spectacular victories. In one of the most unlikely twists of the 11th century, the Cid captured the Moorish city of Valencia, where he ruled as an independent lord. From mid-level knight to one of the great power players of his era, El Cid's life is nothing short of remarkable. And unlike the many fanciful legends, it's the stuff of verifiable history. It is this true-life achievement of El Cid that launched the still-enduring mythos. Now let us turn to the sources and uncover the true Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, the man known as El Cid.
To understand El Cid and his world, it's necessary to review the situation of the Muslim-ruled portions of the Iberian Peninsula in the early 11th century. Up until the first decade of the 8th century, the Iberian Peninsula, what is today Spain and Portugal, was dominated by a Visigothic Christian kingdom with its capital in Toledo. This era came to a dramatic end in 711 when a coalition of Arab and Berber Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and defeated the Visigothic King Roderick at the Battle of Guadalete. The victory proved decisive and Spain, known to the Muslims as Al-Andalus, was brought firmly under the domain of the Dar al-Islam. The city of Cordoba, in the southern peninsula, became the seat of Arab power and Muslim supremacy was unquestioned. Only in the remote and mountainous northwest did Christian rule survive in the tiny principality of Astorias, founded by the Visigothic nobleman Palaio. Throughout the early Middle Ages, the impoverished Christian territories in the north were frequently raiding grounds for the Cordoban armies, as Muslim forces returned almost annually to ravage the villages and gather up slaves. Through such expeditions, Cordoba's rulers demonstrated their primacy over the other great cities of Islamic Spain and rewarded loyalty and regional governors with regular booty. Over four centuries, the Christian North made some progress and won a few victories, but the situation was scarcely altered. By the 10th century, the ever-triumphant Al-Mansur dominated the Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba. Although in theory, rule was in the hands of the Caliph, Hisham II, Al-Mansur was the real power, with the weak Caliph little more than a puppet. By Al-Mansur's hand, the Christian north was ravaged. Barcelona, Burgos, León, Zamora, and Santiago de Compostela were all left ruined and smoldering. When Almanzor died in 1002, Cordoba's overwhelming power must have seemed unending, and yet Islamic Spain was descending into crisis. The Achilles heel lay in the legitimacy of Almanzor's power and the power of his successors. Over the course of Almanzor's rule, he continuously eroded the role of Hisham II. Soon, the caliphate was little more than a hereditary possession of Almanzor's family, and many factions among the Arab nobility resented this as sheer usurpation. The situation came to a head in 1008, when Almanzor's son, Abd al-Rahman, had himself declared Hisham's heir. This provoked open rebellion among the Arab factions. In 1009, Abd al-Rahman was killed in the uprising, and Hisham himself was deposed. Now, the various regional powers of Islamic Spain entered into a destructive battle with one another for control of the caliphate. Cordoba's central rule collapsed entirely. No longer was Al-Andalus united under a single regime, but a variety of city-states, called taifas, struggled for dominance. Cordoba was now just one of the competitors, with considerable power also concentrated in Sevilla, Badaoz, Toledo, Valencia, Zaragoza, and other prominent cities of Muslim Spain. By 1031, the caliphate itself was dissolved, and with it the age of Islamic hegemonic dominance over the Iberian Peninsula. All this chaos following the death of Al-Mansur would ultimately be of great benefit to the Christian North, which was already becoming stronger and wealthier in its own right. For the whole of the Latin Christian world, not just the small states in the north of Spain, the 10th century had been a time of increased trade, growing wealth, and rapidly developing political institutions. By the start of the 11th century, Six small Christian powers were coming of age along the northerly fringe of the Iberian Peninsula. Asturias, León, Castile, Navarre, Aragon, and Catalonia. Their towns were little more than fortified hamlets, 
especially when compared to the sprawling, splendid capitals of the Muslim Taifa states. As the Caliphate of Cordoba collapsed over the first decades of the 11th century, the Christian North was in no position to directly intervene. And yet, the poor, tiny kingdoms of the Christians were on the rise, while the rich, powerful cities of the Islamic South were undergoing a period of decadence. This wasn't obvious at the time, as the emirs of Sevilla, Toledo, and Granada battled with one another over the remnants of the caliphate. They did not understand that an existential threat was brewing just to their north. Many trends in the north would soon put it in a position to challenge the Islamic South. The Christians of Spain were strengthening their relationship with the rest of Western Christendom, especially France. Pilgrim traffic to Santiago de Compostela was increasing, and with it, trade. Although the Christian North lacked many of the delicacies of the opulent Muslim towns, such as olives, figs, and citrus fruits, it was better supplied with dairy products and meat. Populations were increasing in the northern realms. Centuries of enduring Cordoba's raids had hardened the Christians into a hardy warrior stock, particularly in the new frontier states of Castile and Aragon, which would play such a critical role in the coming Reconquista. A new age was dawning, and it was into this world that would be born the man known as El Cid. Fernando I, crowned King of Leon in 1038, ruled a restless, warlike realm in the northern Iberian Peninsula. Less opulent and cosmopolitan than the Moorish Taifa states of Al-Andalus in the south, the Christian north was nevertheless more dynamic in its development. The 11th century proved to be the moment when Leon Castile was ripe for expansion after centuries in the shadow of Al-Andalus. Fernando's father, Sancho III, had divided his lands among his sons, with Fernando receiving Castile, then a minor frontier region bordering the Moorish south. In 1032, Fernando married Sancha, daughter of Alfonso V, the late King of Leon. But a stormy rivalry brought Fernando into conflict with his wife's brother, Bermudo III, who had inherited Alfonso V's kingdom. Bermudo, intent to curb Castilian independence, crossed the Cantabrian marches with his army in 1037 to subdue the Tierra de Campos, which Fernando considered to be his wife's dowry. Although the Leonese forces were greater, Fernando and his Castilian warriors defeated Bermudo at the Battle of Tamaron. Bermudo himself fell in the very act of charging. According to one chronicler, seven of his knights fell beside him. Fernando had proved the burgeoning energy of the Castilian frontier poised to be a driving force in the rise of the Christian north. Sancho was now heiress to the kingdom of Leon, and her husband Fernando thus became king. The realms of Leon and Castile were united. A new age had begun. It was shortly thereafter, in the early 1040s, that a baby was born to the Castilian nobility, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, who would become the man known to history as El Cid. The birthplace of Rodrigo Diaz, long before he was known as El Cid, has traditionally been identified as the small village of Vivar, which is in Castile some six miles north of Burgos. The tradition may be rooted in truth. His family held estates in the region, and so Vivar is a likely birthplace for the Cid. The year of his birth was roughly 1043, though the exact date is uncertain. What we are certain about is the status of Rodrigo's family. They were Castilian aristocrats. Fanciful modern notions that he was of peasant or even Moorish stock are entirely baseless. We have royal charters witnessed by his paternal grandfather, Lion Nunez, during the reign of Fernando I. Rodrigo's father, Diego Lainez, was a distinguished warrior who fought for the king in the 1050s. The name of Rodrigo's mother is unknown to us, but her father, Rodrigo Alvarez, was a well-born Castilian lord who attended Fernando I's coronation in 1038, frequently witnessed royal charters, and held fortresses for the king. 
Thus, young Rodrigo sprung from a well-connected bloodline. At around 14, Rodrigo joined the household of the king's son, Sancho, where he grew up as one of the prince's companions. This was a most prestigious position, as it put Rodrigo in the inner circle of the king's heir. Young Rodrigo was literate and educated in law, as he would later be appointed to judge certain cases by the king. This portion of Rodrigo's education would have already been in place by the time he joined Prince Sancho, as would his basic skills as a warrior and as a horseman. Much of Rodrigo's education would have been completed in his childhood in the household of his father. Here, he would have been introduced to the arts of literacy, law, courtly conduct, horsemanship, and the skills of combat. Having triumphed over his rivals, King Fernando convened a council at Coyanza in 1055, quote, for the restoration of Christendom. The council sought to improve the condition of the Iberian church and also pledged to uphold equitable justice and the traditional laws of Leon. In the late 1050s, Fernando seized the Moorish-held Lamego and Viseo, pushing his frontier south of the Duero into what would one day be Portugal. In 1060, Fernando struck out with his army through the valley of the Upper Duero, swinging south and conquering some six important fortresses in quick succession. Suddenly, the King of Leon was in a position to threaten Zaragoza, alarming that city's ruler, Al-Muqtadir. Fernando was also positioned to harass Toledo. A striking situation was developing. Although the Moorish Taifa kingdoms had larger, wealthier cities, King Fernando now led the most powerful army on the peninsula. By 1063, the Moorish rulers of Toledo and Zaragoza were paying tribute to Fernando. That same year, Fernando struck out on a raid deep into Al-Andalus, ravaging the taifas of Sevilla and Badajoz, both of which also became tributaries of the Kingdom of León. An enormous change had taken place in 11th century Spain. The Moorish South which had once utterly dominated the tiny Christian realms in the north, now witnessed the rise of León as a hegemonic power. In our next episode, we'll learn how King Fernando organized the transfer of the relics of one of Spain's most beloved saints from Moor Sevilla to Christian León, and how he took power in Coimbra, one of the greatest cities of medieval Portugal. <laughs>